Welcome everybody on Zoom. Welcome everybody in person. Uh, today we're starting uh, Marcelo Sconzi's mini course. Uh, we'll be giving two lectures and today we're very happy to have him. Um, Marcelo, please. Hi everyone. Uh, so, uh, thank Martin for the kind invitation to these lectures. Uh, so my lectures are going to be a, a bit different than the previous mini courses that uh, we had here. Uh, so the previous mini courses typically people pick one theme and went to kind of know a full argument of the tool. I'm not going to do something slightly different. Uh, I'm going to talk about several different things because I want to sort of give you more or less a landscape of some recent developments in relativistic fluids. Uh, you speak just a little bit louder. Yes. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, I'm assuming that people are familiar, of course, with Lorentzian geometry and Einstein equations, but I'm not going to assume that people know fluids. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time uh, introducing from fluids from the basics. So the next 40, 45 minutes or so might be a bit boring for people already, you know, know the, the topic, but I, I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Let's like go jump right in. Uh, and Martin, can you tell me if the right is big enough for you to mind? So let me use the energy momentum tensor of a relativistic perfect fluid for most of the factors that don't talk about fluids without viscosity, but then I'm going to uh, mention uh, something about viscosity tomorrow and also the early topic of my talk, my talk at the VGI conference on Wednesday. So the end momentum tensor of this fluid, it's going to be uh, right in this P plus rho throughout beta plus P. Theta. Uh, so here, of course, this is the space time metric. Uh, rho is the fluid's energy density. Uh, and P is the fluid's pressure. Okay, so uh, these are scalars on your uh, space time. This is the metric. Uh, and u is the fluid velocity. Now, uh, sometimes in most in the literature, a lot of times in physics textbooks, this is called the four velocity, just to emphasize the fact uh, that this is a vector field in space time as opposed to just a vector field in space. And again, if you if you only study the fluids from a classical point of view before, you're used to thinking of the velocity as a vector field in space uh, with a time dependence, but here there's a, a four component. But I'm going, to, I'm going to call it just velocity, right? But keep in mind that that's also terminology. And the four velocity is normalized uh, by the condition that uh, this uh, norm squared on the metric G has to be negative one. So this is uh, saying that the velocity uh, is always a time like vector field. And also saying that uh, uh, basically you can imagine if you have fluid lines in space time, uh, that for each fluid particle that determines like an observer. And you know the observers in uh, general relativity are characterized by, uh, by the uh, uh, word lines. And this normalization is simply uh, uh, fixing the word line because otherwise you could reparameterize, but you still have the same observer. Right? Uh, now here, uh, the, the pressure and the, and the density, there, there's going to be a relation between them, I'm going to say later, but in general, in general, they're not going to be independent things. Okay? Uh, and also, you just notice that this um, normalization implies that if you look at uh, the derivative of, the derivative is always zero, uh, which in particular tells you that uh, if you look at the for acceleration or received acceleration of the fluid, uh, it's going to be new. Well, but for this acceleration, it's going to always be orthogonal 
lost as an explanation. Okay. Uh, now, a lot of times it's going to be uh, useful to think of the following situation. Let's say you have a fluid line here, right? So this is an integral color of your fluid. And at each point where you have your velocity, you can look at this orthogonal, this. And then on the orthogonal, you can construct a frame uh, of orthonormal vectors. So you get, so you get a frame, which is uh, Orthonormal, but orthonormal, of course, in the uh, Lorentzian sense, where uh, the norm square of this guy is negative one. And this is called the fluid's local rest. The local rest frame, simply like when you pick this frame uh, along the fluid lines, and this might be used for some computation. Okay, so uh, the next definition that I need is to, can, can people still see that right here? Okay. The next de definition that I need uh, is the following is the uh, fluids uh, variant current. It's going to be uh, a vector field parallel to the velocity where n is another scalar. Which is called uh, the baryon density. And the baryon density, uh, roughly, you can think is like the roughly this analog, that's the density of the fluid in classical uh, mechanics, right? So the, the point here is that, so think of this roughly as the density of matter, and then rho is the, like the density of energy, right? So you're, and you're separating uh, both things by this point, so and n. Of course, there's going to be a Again, a, a relation between them, and I'm going to state later on. Um, so finally, uh, I, I didn't write the equation of motion yet, but as you already know, one of them is going to be the divergence of the energy is equal to zero. You're going to postulate the divergence of the baryon uh, current equal to zero as well. Uh, but if you just count the number of variables and the number of equations, you're going to see that uh, this does not close. We need one more relation to close the system. Uh, and that's going to give you given by an equation of state. So the equation of state uh, is a relation relating the scalar quantities. I'm going to take here as saying the pressure is going to be a non function of the density, the energy density, and the baryon density. Okay. And now, which equation of state to pick? Well, that depends on the nature of the fluid, right? So these things are uh, either determined experimentally or they come from kinetic theory or you have an educated guess, but that's typically something that's given to you. And for the most part in these uh, lectures, we're not gonna need to know too much about this other than that the smooth function of arguments satisfy some properties. Uh, later on, when we talk about free boundaries, I'm gonna pick a specific equation of state. Okay, but for now, you can just get this smooth function of rho and n. So then now uh, with these elements, I can state what the relativistic Euler equations are. They're going to be the divergence of the moment to zero. The divergence of the baryon current equal to zero. And then you have uh, again the normalization condition for the velocity. Uh, and the fact that uh, the pressure is a known function. Uh, yes. So this equation here corresponds to the conservation of energy. And momentum. Uh, and this is going to be the conservation. Right. And this is just a question of state. Now, of course, this equation is not dynamic. And I could have omitted this because in my definition of the end moment tensor, I already told you that the loss normalized, but it doesn't hurt to say it again here. And I'm going to comment in a second. So, of course, this is not dynamic, it's a constraint. 
but the constraint is propagated by the flow. So if you have initial data that satisfies this condition, then for later time, this loop is going to also satisfy this condition. Uh, <clears throat> so also, basically, uh, it makes sense to assume that all these scalars uh, are non-negative. Uh, and for several of the mathematical properties we're going to study, we're going to in fact require they are non negative. Moreover, we're going to in fact require for several of the mathematical properties they are strictly positive. Okay, but there, there, there's going to be one important case of interest where things are allowed to vanish that we're going to discuss tomorrow, which is the case of a, of a fluid with a free bound. Okay. okay. Uh, so these are just basic definitions, but as I said, I have to go through the basic definitions and stuff. So just bear with me for a moment before you can start discussing something uh, more interesting. <clears throat> now, um, it is convenient to introduce the following tensor, uh, which is phi alpha beta, which is g alpha beta plus two alpha beta. And this is nothing but the projection onto the space or problem. Okay, so this is the projection. To you. Uh, and so why is this convenient? Uh, this is convenient because if I look at uh, this equation here, right? I have a phoenix, so, so this is through a vector. So I can take this vector and I can now decompose directions parallel and orthogonal to you using the projection. Okay. So if I decompose um, divergence of the candy momentum tensor uh, into parallel and orthogonal. Uh, then I'm going to obtain the following equation u alpha d alpha rho plus e plus rho d alpha u alpha to zero e plus rho u alpha d alpha beta plus phi beta alpha plus d alpha zero. And the baryon the current I can just extend like this. So I have these three equations, and again, I uh, have the correlation function, right? And you, you can check already. From, so this is coming from projecting onto the parallel, onto you itself. This comes from projecting the orthogonal, and this is in fact orthogonal because remember that is the acceleration of the fluid. And the acceleration I told you before, the cosmic condition is orthogonal. So both are zero orthogonal to the loss. Then uh, in this decomposition, so this is the conserv based on the conservation of energy. This is based on the conservation of momentum. And this is the continuity equation. And this is the form of the equations that you're going to use. Okay, so we're going to use the, the equations already decomposed to the orthogonal and, and on two. Um, so you so you, you might again if you, if you, if all you, you saw before were classical fluids, you might be wondering how this relates to classical fluids that you learn in undergraduate courses. Uh, and if you take it a non-relativistic limit, uh, then this so this this really goes to the equation for the continuity equation that you have for other equations. This really goes to the uh, equation for the velocity. And this goes to the non-relativistic limit to the equation for the end. Okay, so this equation really reduce the corresponding one the non-relativistic limit. Uh, now, so I'll stand about this condition that uh, the velocity is equal to the initial data, the constraint. So, if you, so this 
this expression here uh, is a projection uh, provided that you already know that u is normalized. So if u is not normalized, then uh, this expression is going to look like this. And you can still write this equation here uh, using this expression for, uh, for the projector. You still write this equation. And then once you have uh, once you have this equation written without knowing that you is normalized, uh, you can quickly now contract this equation uh, with the velocity. And then you're going to get what? You're going to get the t plus rho. Maybe there's a one and a half here, I guess. Uh, uh, u alpha, u alpha, u lambda, u lambda is equal to zero, right? Other term times, but it's projection. So if you just contract the equation uh, in velocity, you get this. And this tells you, at least as long as this coefficient is not zero, right? Uh, that uh, the norm square of u satisfies this uh, evolution equation. In particular, u remains normalized if it's normalized by t. Okay, so that shows the constraints properly. Okay. What's over? Okay, so, uh, so let me just tell you. Uh, Brief words, brief words of what, what you're going to do next. Uh, so, uh, so basically, what, what I want to do next, I want to uh, understand the characteristics of the Ollie system. So, this is, a, this, this is a hyperbolic problem. So, I want you to understand what the characteristics are. Uh, then, uh, then, I want to talk about. Uh, uh, the local opposite problem, right? On top of uh, local opposite stuff. Now, but before I do this, these two things, which are <clears throat> the natural thing you, you want to do, <clears throat> I just need to introduce a little more of background and I need to tell you a little bit about some uh, thermodynamic relations. Okay. <clears throat> so, again, <clears throat> just bear with me for a few more minutes. We're going to uh, I have to introduce a little more definitions and so on, and then you can start talking about uh, <clears throat> the mathematical properties of these equations. <clears throat> now, the point that uh, the point that I, that I want to get to, that I'm going to highlight, and it's going to be an important theme throughout these lectures, is that uh, once we study the characteristics, we're going to see that there are basically uh, Two types of propagation of fluid. Uh, so if you have a fluid, and this is analog, but I already have this in classical physics, there are two types of propagation. One is sound waves, right? uh, and the other is the transport of waves. And those things are going to become clear when you study the graphics. But in order to, to make this phenomena manifest, uh, I need to introduce, it's more convenient to write things in terms of some different variables. So that's what I'm going to. So it's a little bit of thermodynamics first. So the thermodynamic properties uh, basically uh, I'm going to do some new new uh, quantities. The first is going to be the internal energy. Of a fluid, which is defined as n, uh, which is defined by this relation, where the rho is given as uh, n one plus n. Okay. And um, so I'm not going to, so, so through all this lecture, I'm not going to say much about the physics because uh, you know, I'm speaking more to a mathematical audience. Uh, and also, I don't know the physics as well, but but the basic interpretation here uh, is that you see, so you can separate the so remember this is like energy density, right? But you're, but you're in a relativistic setting, so you really, really want to you know think of uh, 
contribution from energy coming from different sources, including the source that comes from the rest mass, right? So here you're basically trying to separate the contributions that come from the mass part from all the contributions to our total energy density. That's kind of what the key interpretation. And then another point that's important is the specific enthalpy, which again is already present in classical physics, which is defined as uh, age, which is P plus rho divided by n, of course, assuming that n is non zero. So, so, so this is a point that's going to uh, play an important role in our, uh, in our analysis. Uh, and if it's not uh, very clear why we do this, I'm going to show you later on that when you write these in terms of this quantity, the equations they are going to present better structure. Okay, so that's kind of also. So, you want to think about the, the physical meaning of this, just you know, think about some quantity that uh, that's going to satisfy good evolution equations. So, E here, what was E? E is the internal energy. But this is the first time we've seen it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm defining, so we're defining like, it. Yeah, I'm defining things. Why is it defined like this? Huh? Why is it defined like this? Yeah, that's to say. So physically, you want to say that you know that the, the total contribution to the energy density has two parts. One is coming from the rest mass, which is n, uh, plus some other contribution that's kind of uh, doesn't come from the rest mass, right? Which is the fact that you're you know, relative to the And so, so that comes from the physics, right? Another way you can uh, you can see where this is coming from is that if you if you study how these equations arise from kinetic theory, it's some sort of you no know, fluid limit uh, that's going to uh, also come from the kinetic equations. Uh, and then finally, I want to uh, we're going to make the following assumption. We want to assume that uh, there exist functions S, which we're going to call this the specific entropy, although we just call the entropy, uh, and theta, the temperature, uh, such that the first law of thermodynamics holds. holds. Uh, and the first law, there are different ways you can write, and we write like this dp is n the h minus n theta the s. Okay. So this is a, a further relation between uh, all these different scales. Now, so again, where is this coming from? This comes from thermodynamics, which we're not going to discuss. And let me also point out that uh, this looks very ad hoc. I'm just saying oh, there exist some functions which I'm saying they have physical meanings, the entropy and temperature, such that this relation holds. Okay. Now, there is a much better and more systematic way of doing this, starting from basic thermodynamics or kinetic theory and building up until. To get to the point where you get to the relation. But again, I'm just trying to cut the chase. And for the mathematical properties we're going to study, all you need to know is that some relation like this is going to hold. Okay, but this is definitely not the right way to introduce these quantities. I'm just in, in this dirty way to save time. So we're just going to assume that there exists these functions such that something like this holds. Okay. And what does that? Do for us uh, does the following. The quick aside question. Yeah. Um, I remember from my um, high school day that you know we were given formulae like this in physics class. Uh -huh. um, but I, I don't think you know I had done relativity. So mm -hmm. these variables are relativistic variables. Yes. So what justifies you writing that? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. That's a part that I'm not discussing, but if you want to fully justify that, you should really then do relativistic kinetic theory, right? And see how 
relativistic thermodynamics arise from relativistic kinetic But the point is that the same thing happens, right? Yes, that's the point. That's right. Now, okay, so that's an important point. Maybe this D here is a space time uh, exterior derivative, right? This sense is different. Okay. Right. So, so, so to write these components, we put it here as a DT. Okay. So, 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 so that is fully realistic. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's another thing which I, I'm stopping you in your tracks a little sure. bit. Um, so, another thing I remember from my high school days is that um, this was only ever expected to hold in a kind of stationary setting. Some kind of assumption that in fact everything is kind of moving very slowly. Yes, yes. So, 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 so this is in thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, which is basically the case for a perfect loop, right? And when you discuss tomorrow uh, the case with this positive, where, where dissipation is present, all sort of conceptual issues start appearing, uh, uh, as you already know from, from, from the discussions we had like back in April, right? So, so, so you're right. So there, there, again, there, there are a bunch of assumptions going to this that not discussing because uh, I want to get to kind of theorems, right? But yeah. I, I could spend like, you know, the 33 hours just no, talking the, about the, the, the main thing I, in my mind was like, when you, when you study the equations for their own state, you, you don't just want to study them in some equilibrium scenario, right? So like this formula is just, you can only maybe apply it in certain settings, but the, but the the, the wealth of scenarios you want to cover with your analysis can be much larger than just this relation. So I'm, I'm just yeah. asking, is there any tension there? Like, okay, is, so um, we only ever allowed to use this formula in like very specific cases. Uh, so as, as long as you are, let me say like this. So first of all, um, so here I'm concerned the case of perfect fluids, okay? So you're denying phenomena like excitation and so on, okay? But even in the context of perfect fluids, uh, one one assumption that's come that uh, is made here is that sort of these relations when you write all these relations between the term and the variable they are all inverted. Right? In the end, whatever two variables you choose to be your primary variables, let's say the density or the or the, in the, in the variable density or the pressure in the end, right? It's more or less like to make that of convenience because all the rays are inverted. But for example, if you have something like a, a, a shock or something like that, that's not going to be the case. Right, and then you have to start to be to, to, to be really careful about how your frame is about your framework, right? So yeah, so, so there definitely there are situations, even in the case of the purple fluid, where, where where some of the assumptions that are made to write down some of the formulas they're not going to work. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, but what this gives to us uh, is the following. So we try right now my. Energy momentum tensor in terms of these other variables. You can quickly check that this can be written like this. And then it's a simple computation. If you look at the equation, this is the uh, projection of the energy momentum tensor on the velocity, which was our energy conservation. Uh, the simple computation to show that this is going to become. The phone expression in this part down here. Now, this is zero because this is the value of density, right? So, this is just the divergence of j to zero. In this whole term here, you can write as u up minus n v alpha h plus v. Alpha p, which going back to this expression here, right? Uh, so we have uh, dp minus what well, got like nbh. Uh, so we end there. So this is simply equal to uh, minus n theta uh, alpha s. Just to do and of course, remember this is equal to zero, right? So this is the 
okay. well, no, this is the contraction of the element tensor uh, with uh, velocity. So this is telling you, uh, telling us that uh, as long as n and theta don't vanish, then the contraction of u with the derivative of the entropy has to vanish. So this is telling us that u alpha d alpha s zero. So I can take the conservation of energy equation I had before and replace by this simpler, very simple transport equation for the entropy. So I think of the entropy as a long my head, right? So we're going to do that in several of the arguments because the simplicity of this equation. And this has a nice physical inter interpretation. It's telling the fluid is what is called locally adiabatic, that the entropy is conserved along the four lines of the okay. <clears throat> okay, so um, so with that in mind, so I'm going to keep the equation here. Uh, And just rewrite then the equations that we have as follows P e plus rho and two alpha and two alpha plus Zero, then I have uh, zero. So I want to assume that the pressure is a functional uh, of the energy density and the entropy. So I'm going to take those as my primary variables. Uh, so, so as I said, I can replace one of the equations by uh, the locally derived condition. And this is just the momentum equation because this whole thing is simply uh, the orthogonal derivative of the pressure, and the pressure of function of rho and s. I just need to expand the chain sort of, okay? So that's why I have a spark with it. <clears throat> and then uh, these equations, can be written in a simple form. Let's say uh, A alpha, so we can use B alpha phi to zero, or the vector phi, which is U alpha uh, rho and S. And just write this as, as a matrix form, uh, where you can write explicitly what this matrix A alpha R. I need to write them explicitly, so it's just given by the following expression. Zero, zero, alpha. And okay, maybe you have to think a little bit, but this part part here is four by four. This part here is one by four. This part here is one by four. Uh, here is uh, one by one, one by one, one by one. This part here is four by one, uh, one by one, and so here alpha, so we have four different matrices indexed by alpha. So alpha is the index of the matrix, right? So you have four different matrices. So for a fixed alpha, then you see this guy here has two free indices. So this is like a four by four, right? For a fixed alpha, this has one free index, right? And we are reading here is the free index of um, the, uh, sorry, the, the rows, right? It's four by one. Same thing here, right? For a fixed alpha, there's one free index index of the row, sorry, the, the, the column, right? So, so, you know, just take a little, you know, writing this in matrix form, let's say matrix three. And why I write like this? Because I want to complete the characteristics. So I want, I have to find the characteristic matrix and take the term, okay? So, so 
So the goal then to find the characteristics. So analyze the one form psi that gives the determinant of this matrix, which is called the characteristic matrix, right, uh, is equal to zero. So I have to contract this value. I have to contract this value C alpha. I'll contract this guy here, C alpha 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 here, and C alpha here, and take the determinant. Okay, this is a computation, but uh, let me just briefly tell you how, how we do. Uh, so, so this, this part here is good, you can expand through, through this the rows here. Now, this part here, you see. Uh, this, when you contract, and you contract here, this gives epsilon, right? So you can multiply the, the first, the four, first four rows by x, by x, uh, x beta, and then when you multiply by x beta, this beta with x beta give epsilon. So we have epsilon here and epsilon here. So you want to you want to use these entries to kill these entries here. Now, this guy here has a xi lambda, but also has a u alpha xi alpha that this guy doesn't have. So then you have to multiply this one by u alpha xi alpha as well. But if you do this, then this guy and these guys are the same. You can use all these guys to kill these ones. Then you get some diagonal, and you determine just the product of the diagonals. Okay? And of course, when you do this, you have to keep track of the operations of, you know, when you multiply a row by something or whatever, right? But if you keep track of these operations and, and just use the rules of determinant. Uh, you can compute, and what you're going to get here in the end is going to be uh, in the form of pressure. You're going to get uh, right here. All that inverse go to the power of four, uh, u alpha to the alpha to the power of four. Uh, and then you're going to get another term that's going to be a little more interesting. It's going to be this term. Uh, okay. Complication, but again, it's not very complicated. Just as I just said, you can just use like the rules of matrix to compute this, and that's all you get. Okay. So now you want to analyze the roots C to this expression equal to C. Now, uh, again, assuming that the uh, people's row not zero, right? So there is that we tell that x. So if these identically zero, right? Then of course uh, every direction is characteristic. You don't want that. Uh, so one one set of roots comes from this expression. So this is telling you that, that the characteristics here are what are precisely the flow line of u, right? The characteristics. Are the flow lines right because of the characteristics just given by by you so 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 remember this this, this is a picture of potential space by the characteristics right so so these are the x's that's by the equation you have to get to get uh, the picture in tangent space uh, you look at all the vector fields that are in the kernel of the one form that satisfies the equation, right? Now, if you think of this as expression that is in a problem between two vectors, right? Then this is like saying that, that the corresponding vector, the dual to this one form, has to be orthogonal to you, which is exactly the condition that uh, so. This one form has its kernel, the vector fields u. So the characteristics are you obtain. This is, this is point wise, right? So the characteristics something on the entire space time, but when you integrate the vector field u, you get its four lines. Is that okay? So, so this is the easy one. But then there are these characteristics here, right? So, so and I have analyzed this. Uh, and for this, 
Whenever I thought about the local rest frame, it's convenient to, to consider a frame where you have U and then you have here uh, U1, U2, U3 uh, that are, um, that are uh, uh, orthogonal to U and orthogonal to themselves, they are space like. And then you can take the dual, right? So you can take it. So, so these are vectors. You can take the dual, right? And look at uh, you can look at the uh, one form of the form uh, e a mu c u, where this uh, these guys are the dual uh, the exact field of the frame, right? So, so maybe this actually the field right inside so just to make sure that uh, yeah. so these are the vector fields and you have the fields. And then if you do that, uh, so this is simply the component is the, the zero component, right? And these are the components on your problem because this is a projection of your problem. So in terms of this frame, this equation here takes the very simple form, let's take C and we're going to write like this A equal to zero to indicate that this is an index with respect to the frame equal to zero minus dp below some i from one three of c a equal i square equal to zero. Okay. Now this is a now it's a use of the different characteristics, right? That they are going to be given by plus or minus c a c zero plus or minus equal to the root of this, right? But now uh, you have to understand what's happening to this guy. And you can see that uh, if dp below is negative, uh, you're not going to find real solutions, right? You're not going to find real solutions, which is telling that the equations are not hyperbolic. Okay, so the return of the pressure is back to the density is negative, you don't get a hyperbolic system, okay? Because you need to have uh, you need to have two roots here for this to be hyperbolic. So that has to be excluded. Then also, if dp so, so here not hyperbolic. If dp below is greater than one, then you can get the, the two roots. But what is happening in this case that the the the, the, the this one form uh, is time like. Okay. And if it's time like, that means that the characteristics are uh, super luminal, right? Because, so, uh, So, so, so um, remember, in quotation space, uh, so let's say these are light columns. So, you want the characteristics of the fluid to be retained space outside the light form, right? Like the fluid stuff. Whatever other net point, because by quality, when you look at the tangent space, what is out, what is outside the light form here in the cotangent space, the tangent space is on the inside, right? The tangent space uh, and here the light form. and then this guy here now in the tangent space is inside. So that's what you want, right? You want, but that means that no. So, so if you look at the quotidian space here, this guy outside the light cone means that this guy here has to be space light. But then by duality, the cone is going to be inside the light. This cut is going to be inside the light cone in the space, right? So that's that's what you want. So, so this not this this doesn't have doesn't happen if the PD law is greater than one, right? So this condition tells us if you want to have something that's hyperbolic but also relativistic. Of super luminal, you need to impose the condition that the P the rho has to be greater or equal to zero and less or equal to one. Okay. 
And this is going to have a very nice system interpretation of something. Uh, and so for, yes, is there is there something I, I understand that we like we like when DPD rows in that range, but what is there anything actually wrong with DPD rows greater than one? Uh, oh, in principle, you can study uh, the other system for uh, for uh, superluminal uh, super, super cations, right? Now, if you want to do that, what uh, you'd have to go back and really make sure that all the kind of standard constructions that are done go through in that case. And that, that I haven't thought about which of the standard, the most standard results you go through uh, if you assume that the is better than one. Okay, but that, that's something you have to be careful. Uh, so then it's quite possible some of the standard mathematical results would not go through that case, or, or but that, that it, it will have to be checked. I don't know. Okay, but um, because the results are always assumed that's less than Does that answer your question? Uh, I'm just wondering if this. So I I don't I'm not a physicist. I don't know how it works in nature. Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, we have good reasons to believe we should be in this range or whatever, mm -hmm. but I, I'd like to know mathematically what happens when you're not in that range. Yeah, and the fair answer is that no, I don't have a good answer to the question because we have, we have, I would have to go back and kind of revisit several different results and just think they go through uh, without that assumption. And on top of my head, I can tell you they go through a lot. Okay, because mm -hmm. usually they all they all just that. Sure. Another question I have, which is the question from maybe ten minutes ago, is that. I, I just want to understand when this uh, transport rewriting using the first law, when that's legitimate. And I, I still don't have any understanding of that. So uh, you, you, you mentioned that shocks are a place where you can't expect such a thing, but are shocks the only place where I should expect such a thing? And moreover, is there a mathematical definition that justifies me writing that equation? Mm -hmm. Is there like, you said it was something to do with equilibrium. Is there some kind of way of actually making that precise mathematically and saying, okay, when you have such and such condition, then you can write this relation? Yes, uh, you, you can make it precise. I'm just not going to take it. Sure. We can talk later, but that, that, that requires to really go. Again, as I said, I, I gave you sort of the dirtiest way of the introducing this point. This, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. We'll have to kind of go back and discuss exactly how these things uh, are defined, which I'm not doing. But sure, yes. sure. And definitely do everything the size and, and keep track of all the assumptions. That, that there's no hand waving that yeah. Great. Okay, uh, so we have the assumptions, and uh, so so under this assumption here, we see then that um, the characteristics here they really have so this is really a cone, right? Now this is really a cone, right? So, we have, in fact, have a structure of two opposite now uh, f forms, which under the assumption they are always uh, inside the light form. Uh, now, the case where this is zero, actually, um, in that case, the characteristics are degenerating and becoming just the same characteristics we had before, the flow lines. And that's all definitely possible, but it's something that we really want to discuss tomorrow because that's the case where you have a, 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 a vacuum bound. So from, from now on, we're going to assume that this is all is strictly greater than zero. Okay, and tomorrow we're going to talk about the case when it's zero. Uh, so all this is good. Uh, so now again, to use the following uh, definition. Uh, that quantity that we just introduced uh, go square root uh, is the fluid sounds good. and an assumption that here okay. So uh, why is this? Um, so why is this the fluid sound speed? Uh, well, the first thing you can check for a physicist is to check that this quantity really has units of 
velocity, if you can do that. But another way is the fall. Let's go back to the evolution for the density. Let's look at the equation. Let me take a u derivative of this equation. Okay, so if you take a u derivative of this equation, I'm going to get uh, u alpha, right, u alpha, u lambda, u alpha, u lambda more. Okay, I'm going to get p close go uh, u alpha. Uh, the lambda the alpha the alpha the lambda then everything else I'm going to move to the side okay so I'm just keeping keeping track of the third third second order degree okay so I took I took u alpha u alpha so this term this guy derivative of u that's going to be a first order term on the right hand side here I commute the covariant derivative so now if I move that space Curvature and move to the right hand side, and I, and I have like a new derivative keeping uh, this term. Okay, and now this term using the momentum equation is going to be equal to minus Cs squared um, divided by p plus rho uh, by. Uh, alpha lambda uh, d alpha rho plus this stuff. Okay, so you just use the momentum equation. And then when this derivative reaches this guy here, what we're going to get, we're going to get u alpha lambda d alpha lambda rho. You get a minus sign. This guy can be that guy. And then you get cs squared. I remember CS squared is the derivative of the vector density. And then we get pi alpha lambda, d alpha, d lambda rho, equal to everything else in the right. And this now is like a wave equation, right? Because u is a time like vector. So this is like this is like d t, this is like two time derivatives, right? Use a time like vector. This is like a flash. Because phi is the projection of the of you, so this is a spatial terrain. So this is like a flash. So this is like a wave equation for rho. Okay. It's like a wave equation for rho. And in a wave equation, the term you want to plot here. A flash is your speed, right? So this really is showing that this is the speed. And why is it the sound speed? Because a wave equation for rho. And how the sound propagates? Sound propagates by compressions and refractions, by the wave. Compressing and expanding the, the medium, the density, right? So this is really a sound. sound. So this really tells that this guy is not sound waves. So the punchline is that we found the characteristics uh, of the order system are the uh, sound waves and the flow waves. Okay. So all this. Um, all this leads us to the following definition, which in a sense is the most important definition of these lectures. The acoustical metric uh, is the Lorentzian metric. Capital G given by the form. So G alpha beta is the sound speed to the minus two the alpha beta plus C S minus two minus one to alpha beta. Uh, C inverse C is a not more like that. G minus one alpha beta is CS squared G alpha beta minus one minus CS 
square alpha beta. Okay. Um, so there are several claims here. Uh, the first that you can check using the line. Then your indices should be up, right? Uh, yes. So, so relying on the line on the fact that you normalized, you can check if this in fact our internet. Okay, so this defines our internet uh, in our space. And it's inverse, it's given by this expression here, I'm doing this in the right place. Uh, and uh, you probably, again, you're probably familiar with notation, but just make sure everybody's the same page. Uh, I'm going to write explicitly minus one alpha beta. I'm not going to write, I'm not going to write like this, because I'm writing like this, there's some ambiguity, because the indices are always raised and lower with the space time metric. But if I simply take this expression and lower the, and uh, put the indices up, right, and raise the indices, I don't get this, right? If this action of you know, matrix form is the actual inverse, right? So, so we're going to be careful the notation. Uh, so, so this is our inside metric. Now it's called the acoustical metric, right? So maybe I can also write this as C S square by alpha beta minus the alpha beta. And in the second form, you can use easily see the characteristics of this metric, right? The CS that satisfy the equation are precisely the forms that you can report, right? And so that's the same expression we have before, right? So this is the Lorentz metric whose characteristics whose are given by these forms, which are the characteristics of the Euler system corresponding to the propagation of sound waves. That's what's called the acoustical metric. Okay, that's a acoustical metric. Uh, and that is so so the forms. The cones of, which means the characteristics, which is the, the no, the no uh, hypersurface of metric, which is, are the forms, uh, they're called the sound cones. The same way that you call light cones, you know, for Einstein equations, because the propagation of light is propagation of sound, we call them sound cones. Okay. Is that okay? Now, why? Why I say this is probably the most important definition. So here's the big idea that you should take away from this discussion. Uh, the relevant geometry for the fluid uh, is the acoustic geometry. And the acoustic geometry is the characteristic geometry of the acoustic geometry, right? Because, so again, this is a hyperbolic problem, so we have to really understand the characteristic geometry, right? The characteristic geometry of the, of the, the no hypersurface physics back to the correct metric. And what this is showing, in terms of the discussion we just had of the characteristics, is that the relevant geometry for the fluid, it's not a space time geometry, shouldn't be, because the space time is Minkowski, not nothing's happening, but it's the acoustical geometry. And the acoustic, uh, the, the acoustic geometry uh, in general is going to be no flat, even if you're doing this in Minkowski background, right? So if you're doing you some of the, the, the equations in Minkowski background, the, the relevant geometry. Which is the geometry of the fluid, which types the characteristics of the audio system, is generally it's not going to be flat. Okay, so that's kind of the, the big message that relevant to geometry, not the space time geometry, it is the acoustic geometry. Now, of course, if you couple these two Einstein equations, then the space time geometry is also dynamic, is also relevant. And then you have two different geometries, and you can see how rich the system is going to be, because you have two different geometries that are interacting with each other. You have the acoustic geometry. This space time geometry. The interaction of these two geometries is what makes this problem really hard, but also really beautiful and rich. Okay, so the Einstein Orange system is a very rich problem because of these two different geometries that are interacting with each other. So 
part of it. Okay, so um, the next thing I want to so, so let's let's keep this idea. But then the next thing I want to talk about is the relativistic coefficient. So again, in classical fluid dynamics, uh, an important point is the constant of vorticity of the fluid. We want to have the same thing in relativity. And then the question is uh, how to define. Uh, so in classical fluids, the vorticity is just the co of the velocity. Uh, here, uh, this will be something more complicated. But uh, let me define and explain why. So the enthalpy current uh, is the falling vector through W. Which is simply take your four velocity or your velocity, and you rescale by the amp. Okay. And then uh, once you have the enthalpy current defined the way, the vorticity of the fluid is a two-form, which is simply the exterior derivative of the enthalpy current. So again, this is a space time. Okay. So, uh, so for our two components, it's going to be uh, V alpha H beta minus V beta alpha. And you can replace this by the full derivative just because the distinct derivative is constant. Okay. So, so that's how the vortices is defined the relativity. Now the question is why? Uh, Wait, Marcelo, just the root city question. Uh, um, so the acoustic metric. So um, if I compute its curvature, can you? Are there ever solutions where GAB is is you know curved, but uh, the acoustic metric is flat? So, uh, let's finish with the question. Uh, so, suppose meaning, little GAB has non trivial curvature, so it would not be covered in space time. So. Okay. But GAB, big GAB, is flat. flat. Does, that, does that happen ever? Uh, okay, I, I can tell top of my head that it does not happen. I just don't know any example, but it's uh, an interesting question. Well, that's going to depend on the equation of state, right? So, uh, so let's see if you take uh, I would say maybe start with a linear equation of state, right? So then uh, the p below is just constant, right? Let's say p equals to both, right? But you see how it depends on the velocity, right? Uh, now, of course, you can, you can construct flows where the velocity is constant, the sort of trivial, right? And in that case, uh, yeah, but you still have the metric here, right? So, uh, so yeah, so it's not obvious. It's a good question. But not obvious. I guess the point is that, like, the flat metric, uh, Lorenz, like, you know, GR. Is when it's flat, it's interesting. It's, it's Minkowski space time, mm -hmm. very rigid, important, rich mm -hmm. space. So I'm just trying to see is there a notion of flatness for acoustic metric? Is there some rigidity? Is there some interest? I haven't thought about it. That's a very interesting question. That's a very nice question. So if you figure out that no. <laughs> okay, so uh, so why do we define we define what this like it is? Uh, so if you remember uh, in classical physics, we had something called the Kelvin circulation theorem, which are the following: we define this quantity to the circulation, which is an integral along some 
four square. So gamma. Okay. So here's so this is the class of the last. Okay. So all class. Uh, in this point, it is conserved along the top. I can class for two weeks. So this is standard form. So if you take a, a closed term here, and I say gamma at a certain time q1, and you look at how this closed, this closed term is transported by the fluid. So here's the first is the curve at a later time q2. And of course, this is transported by the full line. So here's the velocity. But then you have the curl, right? So in the curl are these little vortices. Right? So, this, so now these are these, these red guys are the, the four lines of the curl of the velocity, the classical vortices, right? And the Kelvin's equation theorem is essentially tell is a conservation law to tell you know, sort of the amount of vorticity, the total amount of vorticity inside this closed curve is conserved along the floor. And that's such a nice physical conservation law that uh, you would like to have the same general activity. But because the questions are different, if you just try to define the vortices, as, let's say, D of U, you know, this is not going to happen. Okay? So the, the point of defining vortices this way is that with this definition, an analog of Kelvin's equation theorem holds for a So you can make the same kind of construction. Now, this is going to be a U derivative, right? U, U, D, U, but the same kind of construction holds not even, right? So, so we have a relativistic Kelvin circulation theorem, provided that you use the correct definition of Is that okay? But then this has some nice consequences. So there's a computation, which I'm not going to do, it's about half page long, and do it an exercise, uh, in, in, done in textbooks. Uh, so, the computation that if you take now the vortex and contract the velocity, and you, you have to use the equations, so you use the equation of motion. There are some steps I'm skipping. You're going to find that this is equal uh, to theta, the beta derivative of s. So, so we have this identity. So uh, this is called sometimes the Lee Narovich equation. Not the one that you use in scalar curvature, right? Mm -hmm. It's also called, but, it, but it's the same Lee Um And why is it, why is this equation interesting? The equation interesting because of the following. Um, so instead of a fluid is rotational when it has no vortices, right? So that's part of it. But the average equation is telling that you know, uh, if the fluid is rotational, then again, provided that the temperature is positive, if you are assuming, uh, then the entropy has to be constant. And such fluids are called isentropic. So, so in rotation, in rotation uh, fluid relativity uh, is necessarily isentropic, and this is a result that has no analog in classical physics. Classical physics can be rotational without being isentropic, and so on. Right? So that's why if you look at the paper on classical Euler, you see results like result AX or uh, fluid, and then somebody comes along and improve generalized result X for a fluid that's also isentropic and stuff like that. So, but it, so this, this is a purely relativistic phenomenon, which is interesting, and is related to the fact that there is this relation between the vorticity and the atom. So quick question, mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the Kelvin thing about? Uh, yeah, the Kelvin, uh, so then in classical physics, you have this statement that if you look at the amount of vortices inside our closed curve, right? Uh, that's concerned, right? So if you look at, uh, so, so 
Então, not all because you have to take, take, take the material that you put the guy and by some computations, uh, individual parts, it's not this is going to pop out. But the point is that the amount of vorticity inside a patch is conserved along the flow. So if you look at the other time T1, look at the time T2, so you see how this curve is transported by the flow, this quantity here is conserved. And the claim is that if you want the same, if you want an analog result to hold in relativity, the vorticity has to be defined in this way using the uh, entropy curve. And then once, once you make a definition, then a consequence is that you have this uh, relation between the, con the contraction of the vorticity and velocity and uh, the gradient of the entropy. Which tells it a rotational fluid with the desired right, so just, just to understand the derivation, so the, the Kelvin thing uses the equations of motion, you know, mm -hmm. the classical equation of motion. Mm -hmm. So, what you're saying is, like, if I want to use the relativistic equation of motion, I have to write it like this. If I, if I want an analog of this thing, if I want an analog of this, right? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so um, the So, uh, so, so now I think now we have all the elements you need uh, to talk about local existence and uniqueness. Oh boy. Okay, I, I was planning to prove local existence and uniqueness for you. Uh, but for the sake of time, I guess I'm going to just state the result. I mean, this is classical stuff if I'm learning textbooks. Okay. Uh, so maybe let me just uh, point out the form. Um, so there, there are different ways of doing local existence uniqueness. The most straightforward way that you want to find in textbooks, you can actually write the relativistic Euler. And write your existing order as a first order schematic hyperbolic okay. okay, and then just textbook uh, material, you get local existence. There's another way, which was what I was planning to do, but I'm going to have to skip for this little time, it's more interesting, which is uh, by coupling with the vortices. So this is under the assumption of the PG row is in the rate, in the rate? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's strictly very different. Oh, but the upper bound is not required? The upper bound, yeah. the upper bound uh, is, is stated as an as assumption. And as I said before, I never right. thought about you know, the proof would carry through without, without this. Okay. Everything here is CS, strictly made to zero. Okay, uh, so there's another, uh, there's another uh, um, approach which is called the vorticity, which was done originally by Shokir Buha. And she did for the case without entropy and narrow reach. Standard to the entropy. Uh, and the, the way that that's done is that that's a, derive an evolution equation for the vorticity and, um, and a couple of the system. And that's going to be a trans transport equation, evolution, the evolution equation for the vorticity is like a transport equation. And uh, that allows allow to drive that. So I'm just very briefly mentioned where this equation is coming from. You see, uh, once you have this identity, you can write this identity as follows. You can write that as the interior contraction, the interior contraction of the vorticity uh, of omega is equal to theta ds. Okay. And then if you take uh wait, Marcelo, for these results, uh just remind us what's the what's the geometry of the 
parametrometry, like are we are we solving high spectrometry? No, so like it's just relativistic order, right? This is the audit, but I, I'm going to say the result, but it can also do the same thing for high both, both, both approaches uh, you can couple to twice in your problem. But these like early results definitely compete based on these are direct couple Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to say last one. Okay. So so this equation here you can write uh, as follows, right? And and what is happening is that now if you take an exterior derivative of this guy, so here we're going to get some like right, and then here uh, we're going to get essentially. So remember, like you can write the new derivative as i x d omega plus d i x of omega, right? But when you apply this form of the derivative to this guy, d omega is zero because omega uh, uh, is a uh, is a uh, uh, closed form, right? The minus d of something. So this is going to give you the new derivative of omega. So you see that you have a solution equation now for omega, right? So now you can just express this as a transport equation. transport equation. And what is interesting about the transport equation is that if you just naively think in terms of calculating derivatives, you see omega is like one derivative of u, right? Then you say, okay, so now transport equation for omega would be like two derivatives of u. Now, one derivative of u from the equation satisfied by u is like one derivative of s. So here you expect that this would give you two derivatives of s, but that, that's not the case because the derivative of s here appears as an exact derivative. So you take another d, that d squared is zero, right? So, so you have a sort of gain of derivative. Yeah, there's one less derivative of s uh, than what you'd expect by just counting derivatives. And that's what allows you to close estimates for the vorticity and get the local existing weakness in this approach of the region for the one. So I'm going to skip the proof, but again, uh, this is like a sort of um, textbook stuff. Let me just state. Um, Let's take this theorem. So here we're going to consider the case where, uh, yeah. so you can take, let's say, uh, rho and the mu if you want as your uh, primary variable. Again, you could use, let's say, sorry, let's take rho as mu, you could use rho and of mu. And again, a, a, as long as all the relations between the scales are invertible, you can pick any two to be your primary variables. Uh, so we'll consider data for the relativistic or the equations. Speed. So all, all this is just data, right? So, uh, so assume that uh, u times zero is normalized. Uh, 
And I'm not going to go into detail because you know, you know how the series go, so we can certainly get uh, all the details you want precisely. Uh, and the, the whole point, of course, is that, that uh, the solution is as variable as the data, right? So if our data is made one plus one, it is the solid space, then we get existence and uniqueness. Uh, we can get more. In fact, we got the uh, Cauchy stability, uh, where the data is going to be in H plus one for each constant time slice. So it's just like standard vanilla uh, local uniqueness, but I think it's important to state because that's what we started with. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the tendency of the tendency of the why are you thinking how to couple this to like Einstein equation? Do you understand the regularity of the equation? Uh, yeah, so, so if you couple to Einstein equation, you can still do this for the fluid, but uh, Einstein equation is one of the right types. So for the natural, you need one more derivative. Right, and that, that doesn't change this. Huh? That does not change this. No, that doesn't change this. Yeah, that doesn't change this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so since you ask, I mean, similar for Einstein, okay? Uh, again, this is all textbook material, but if anybody wants to see the proof, just come to see the lectures we can discuss. Okay, because I, I already spent too much time on background, I want to get to actually the actual theorem that I want to discuss. What are the results on the construction of such data? Uh, you mean in a couple of Yes. Uh, you mean solving the constraint equations? Yeah. yeah you, you can do this on the plus. Given the data for the fluid, you can search like J and Rho. In J and Rho, the this uh, And then you do like the, the. Now, if that's the most general, let's say, uh, you can do for all the cases. Well, you can do for all the cases. Like, yeah, the topological is cheaper than so one. But uh, uh, I think that the, so, but in, let's say the regular case is pretty much like you know the never right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to move on and Uh, I want to tell, so so here here's the basic idea of what we're going to call. Okay, so we have this acoustic format, okay, which is again I'm going to have to tell it's an important point because it's really tied to two characteristics of the problem. Now, if you write the equation, if you try to solve the equation, so I said before, if you still write the first order hyperbolic system, you are not really seeing the characteristics, right? You just do this algebraic construction, right? Uh, it works for this basic theorem, but it doesn't really, it does, you don't read to the silica If you use the linearity approach, and again, I, so I, I don't have time to show to you, but uh, if you look at his book, he actually uses the acoustic map. Right? So back in 1967, he was already, already using the acoustic map. He writes explicitly the wave operator for the acoustic map. But what he does, he takes an extra derivative, so he writes the, uh, the, the moment equation is a third order hyperbolic equation. Right? And of course, you can do estimates for hyperbolic equation of any order, but that sort of new, that, that sort of you know, kind of a, uh, cannibalizes the equations that all the, all the low order terms they have bad structure. Now, for local existence, that's not a problem because you can just you know the low, the low order terms can be basic anything. But if you want to do anything more, Sophisticated, the lower returns matter, and the precise way that everything is tailored to the characteristics also matter. So, what you're going to do, you want to find a new way of writing the order equations, the relativistic order equations, that are going to make the role of the characteristics 
manifest, but are going to have, have good lower order terms. Okay. Uh, and that's the next topic, which we call a new formulation of relativistic. Also, yeah. Since we're coming up to about an hour and a half, uh -huh. uh, we're going to take a little break. But sure. was, is it a good time now, or should we wait a little? Anytime. Is good. Anytime. All right. Well, let's take a let's take a five minute break. Yeah. Five or ten minutes break. Okay. So as I was saying, we want to now rewrite the other equations. In a way that's going to be uh, useful for applications, we we'll might discuss later. And the whole idea is to you now uh, make the role of the characteristics manifest. So, for simplicity, from now on, I'm going to assume that G is the important symmetric. Uh, if we're doing it for a general background metric, uh, that's not. In other words, like this. There's nothing uh, special about the Nikolaj scheme. Everything we're going to talk about here it will be for a general background match. Okay, so I'm just going to do the Nikolaj for instance. Now, in order to, to, to talk about the new formulation, I have to uh, introduce several auxiliary quantities. So let me introduce them here. The first one is the log entropy. Uh, which is AG hat, which is simply the logarithmic of the entropy. Okay. Uh, so um, typically you should write the A is divided by AG bar, which is the bar is some fixed background value, just because you need to be the main dimension of this, but you know, all constants for us are one, so that's fine. Uh, in my notation, log is given ln, right? Log because I write ln, kind of like handwriting is not very good. Uh, then the next one we need is the new orthogonal vorticity. Uh, defined as follows it's going to be omega bar is going to be the, the vorticity operator applied to A two, and this vorticity operator is defined as follows vorticity alpha of any vector v is minus epsilon alpha beta. Delta mu beta uh, v gamma v delta. Okay, so given a vector for v, I can define this sort of space time co operator, which by construct is orthogonal to velocity because if I contract this with uh, uh, u alpha, the indices alpha and beta are anti symmetric. This is the total anti symmetric uh, answer. Uh, and now I can apply this to HU. Now, this is called uh, your power of vorticity. And here we have HU that we used before to define the vorticity. You might be wondering how this relates to our omega. And this relates by quadruple duality. Okay. So, uh, so this is actually related to our Prince omega by quadruple duality. But um, uh, but turns out that for what I'm going to discuss, I don't need the full vorticity of two form. I just need to write it back. Which is done in this way. Okay. So the other point that I need is the entropy gradient. Which is simply uh, simply the uh, the gradient of the entropy. And then I have one very important point, which is the modified. Uh, modify vorticity of the vortices. Okay. This is the following point. I'm going to call it C alpha, and then is the vorticity alpha of an bar plus Cs minus two. This is going to be some, something complicated, so let's write it down. I'm going to explain to you. Delta plus theta minus theta h 
that's alpha divergence to u plus theta minus theta to h to alpha s lambda to lambda f plus theta minus theta lambda is alpha delta delta to So can you explain it? Okay, so where is this coming from? The whole point is the following. So in the theorems I'm going to prove, I'm going to talk, talk about uh, hopefully three results due to the applications of the new formulation. One is going to be an improved regularity results for Euler, showing that you can gain a derivative for the vorticity and entropy. Then we're going to talk about low regularity solutions uh, for the system. And then we're going to discuss the problem of shock formation. And all those are problems that go through this new formulation. Now, the point is to, when, you, when you're going to do estimates for the equations, one quantity, which I'm going to show you later on, you need to control, you need to control this guy. Which is the vorticity of the vortices. This guy needs to be controlled more. But you cannot. You cannot get a direct estimate for this. Okay? It is not, not, not as far as we know. But it turns out that if you define this new quantity C, which is the quantity you want to estimate, plus all this junk, some miraculous constellations happen. And this quantity C satisfies a better evolution equation. That allows us to give it to that estimates. Okay. And it's not obvious at all why all this is the junk that you need to add to this quantity, but that's what it happens. Okay. And I'm going to illustrate this in a simplified case. Okay. So, so then you have this vortice of the vorticity, which um, uh, puts something in here. And finally, there's another quantity that we need, is the G, which is n over n, G delta S lambda plus one over n, S lambda G lambda is S minus one over n, C S is minus two. And the point of this quantity D is something similar to C. When you go to estimate with one quantity, you need to control the divergence of the entropy gradient. So, right? You need to control this one. Turns out, again, if you try to construct control this quantity by itself, you cannot cause the estimate. But if you consider this new quantity, which is what you want to control, plus this junk, this quantity D satisfies a better evolution system on which you can derive it. And none of this is obvious. I'm going to try to illustrate to you in some computations. Okay. Uh, okay. And then uh, I can now state our new formulation. This is the form. This is a um, so we have we take up as primary variables the uh, log enthalpy. The, the log is just a convenience that of course the enthalpy is not including the log, the enthalpy is the velocity. So we assume that this guy is C3. I'm going to apply this to smooth solutions. And the following system of equation holds. You can rewrite the other equations as a system of wave equations. And now the equations are, as you can imagine, by this kind of expression, the equations are really sort of long, as I'm going to destroy. I'm going to write them schematically, which is all we're going to need. Or, um, 
I explain what the symbols mean in a second. We'll just write them down. So the quantities uh, log enthalpy S and U is satisfy wave equations, where here this of course is a wave operator, is a fully covariant wave operator of um, the acoustical metric. And for you, I'm writing explicitly this because I'm really think of this as a wave operator by the scalar function, I'm applying this separate to each component of the velocity. Okay, so those are the wave equations, but then there are more equations that are satisfied. So we have transport equations. And we have, we have for, uh, And then you have what you call this is the new part of the new part transport code systems. Let's take the point form. C is the L. We have the history of convergence of the mega bar. Explain what these guys are. So, these two, they represent a linear combination of some quadratic terms. So, I just remember now here Q of DAS, DU, DAU. It's a linear combination of terms that are quadratic in either, let's say, DSU or DSDH. Right? So, all possible quadratic terms. They're quadratic, but then more than quadratic, there are no forms. So this is going to what I was mentioning before, that, that the structure of the lower order terms are matter, and this, will, this quadratic lower order term, there were no points. Okay. And the ALs are simply linear terms. So again, for, for, most, for most of the discussion, right? So this is, this is going to be something that's going to be linear in the derivative of H, a linear combination of things that are linear in the derivative of H, bar, sorry, H hat, and G, okay? So they're just going to be linear. So the, the, the crucial aspect here is that we can rewrite the relativistic of equations as this big system. But as I'm going to uh, try to convince you, this big system, uh, even though it looks complicated, is much better than the original system because all the equations have good structure. Right? As I don't have to tell you what makes an equation a system good or not. It's not how long they, or ugly they look, but it's the kind of structures they have. Right? The original equations they look very simple, but they have no good structure. It's very easy to can do that. These equations look horrible, but they are more, but show to you they have value in structure. Okay. So, um, so that's the point um, of uh, of writing the system. And okay, so um, the proof. Uh, so the proofs 
is a very long and delicate computation, which I'm gonna, not going to give to you. Okay, like I don't know, 80 pages of computation. But the whole point is the following: we start with okay, this plus the following. We start with the original equations, and we differentiate the original equations with respect to some vector fields, some vector fields, uh, um, so some, some some geometric vector fields. And that in itself is not very promising. But what happens is that there are some miraculous constellations that happen all over the place. Okay. Uh, so, for example, if um, if you look at this if, if you look at this equation for the vorticity, okay. So remember, remember this guy is like the vorticity at the vorticity, right? So it's like the vorticity of omega. Right, it's the vorticity of the vorticity of the right. So, so I, I raise the limit like the, vort the vortice of the vortice. So this C, uh, this C uh, has two derivatives of U, right? And then if you take a U derivative, you would expect to have something in general which is going to contain three derivatives of U. But not only you don't have a third derivative of u on the right side, the, you have the second derivative that appear are not arbitrary second derivatives, but they are appearing exactly in C again. Right? Even if you don't have a third derivative, you could expect you to have some kind of second derivatives that are arbitrary second derivatives of u. Okay? But that doesn't happen, right? So this appears in closed form, which means you have derivative, you have like a evolution equation for C. You have a C back here. So, as you can imagine, just by looking at the definition for this of the vortice, vortice of omega, right? Omega, omega bar, which is for this of U, and again, not used like H U, right? But, uh, there's no reason to expect this kind of structure, right? So, some, some, some mirac miraculous constellations need to happen for you to get an equation to start. And, and that's some delicate computation. You have to be uh, very careful. Uh, to make sure that you observe all the necessary constellations that is okay. and, uh, and that's a computation that I'm, I'm not going to show you, but given these equations, uh, I'm going to show what you can do with that. Now, I have a few remarks to do to make here. Um, the first, if the two is zero rotational, these equations reduce the equations that Crystal Dulu has in his 2007 monograph and his work on. Shocks, right? So in his monograph and breakthrough result on shocks were a bit further. If you look at the case of a new rotational fluid, uh, and again, to, to, to do to, to, to implement this framework, it also needs to use uh, to use uh, some new formulation equations, and the new formulation that he has uh, are such that ours reduce to his indicated limitation. Now, if you look at the classical water equations, there is also some similar formulation, uh, which is due to by uh, the, uh, Jonathan and Jared, uh, which they also use for their work for the on constructive proofs of shock formation for uh, classical water. Now, what I want to point out is the fact that you have something, the fact that something was already known for classical water for the rotational case. Should not make you think that this is just okay. So you just go and extend those rules. And the reason why you shouldn't think like that is because the structures present in these equations, the classical case of they're they are unstable in the perturbation, right? Because to get the equations both in the classical and the rotational case, the same story has to happen. You need to have some miraculous constellations. And every time you have some miraculous constellation. That's unstable. If you say anything, if the equation is slightly different, there is no reason to expect that the constellation to happen again. So it's quite surprising that in the more complex case of the relativistic Euler equations with vortices, you can still get some kind of equations like this. This, I think, is quite surprising. Okay. Um, so, how did you guys like compute? I mean, how did you get the intuition for what you compute, et cetera? Uh, well, uh, I would say a little bit is a kind of a try and error, uh, a lot of persistence, right? 
And basically, uh, the idea that if you don't have something like this, then you cannot apply any of the techniques you want to apply, which uh, are coming from uh, from GR and weight equations. Right? Which, but, yeah. but with C, like the way you define C and stuff, but this is an actual analog. No, 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 no. no. Okay, it's, it's, it is an analog, but it's different. And again, that's all the world trying to get, right? Because the analog only gets that that far because, as I say, if, if you're far by a factor of one half. Everything makes a part, right? Yeah. Because you need to have the exact constellations, sure. right? And if you're not, not only that, this guy has to be exactly no points, right? So, so everything is, is very dedicated. But so this, so, so I guess this leads me lead to the next method I want to convey to you before I start proving things, which is the following big idea. And so, so forget about, you know, uh, how complicated the equation look like? Just in fact, conceptual explanation is the following. These equations they make the role of the characteristics very manifest, but these are the wave operators for the physical metric, and these are all transport equations along with four lines of Okay. Now, what you gain is the following: once you write everything as wave equations, the idea is that you want to see this whole system as a perturbation. Wave equations of the form. Something quadratic. We have an equation. We have a wave equation of this form where the metric g depends on psi, and that's the case that you have, for example, rotational fluid. Uh, for a way of this type, there's an, a very uh, powerful framework coming from GR in the study of nonlinear waves, which lets you handle equation of this type. Okay, so that's done for, for, for the decades now. People have developed, developed techniques to study this type of wave equations. So by casting our system as some wave, some wave equations for the acoustical metric. You want to see this the audio system as a perturbation of this guy. That's kind of the, the, the basic philosophy, the basic underlying philosophy. Uh, now, of course, the word perturbation should not fool you because the exact structure of the perturbations really matters. It's not like saying, okay, now all the rest are perturbation, you can just think of the techniques. No, the exact structure matters. Uh, that's why you have to be very careful with these other equations here, this transport and this code. Uh, but that's what the basic philosophy. So we want to rely as much as possible on all this uh, powerful framework that has been developed in the context of JAR and non linear waves. Right? And that's why you're writing this system of wave equations. That's kind of the basic idea. Um, and now, um, Now, if we have this, uh, let me start discussing uh, some results so you can get from this new formulation. The first result we'll discuss is some improved regularity. Okay. So, this will prove in the same paper. Uh, and the following. Relativistic on your system is locally well posed. Um, data uh, H S U. In H N plus H one plus H N plus plus H N. That's for the inverse.
So, so let's say the fault. So, if you give me data, yes, you where age is in AGM, so that's like the standard regularity you had before, and u is in HM, again, that's the standard regularity. So, these two guys here, there's nothing new, the standard regularity. But now I'm assuming something different for the entropy. I'm assuming that the entropy, instead of being in HN, is in H plus, plus one. So I'm assuming for my data next to derivative for the for the entropy. And then the vorticity, of course, the data for the vorticity, how we construct data for the vorticity, uh, we have to use the equations to solve for the derivatives of u, evaluate the time is zero. Right, because the work is involved one derivative of you, we put in time derivatives, but you can just use the equations. And in general, if you use in AG and the work is going to be in H and minus one. But you can pick data, this of course is special data, but you can pick data where the special combination of derivatives of you, the time zero, is such that that dissolves in AGM. Now that in principle doesn't tell you anything because uh, if you look at the standard methods, go back to either the proof that I didn't give to you by the which or the first order special theory system, you can assume this guy to be a million times more differential. But the solution in the end is going to be only in HN plus HN plus HN plus HN. No matter how much more differentiability you assume for your data. The standard methods are going to tell you the solution is going to be only in the lowest of the ends as long as it's precise. Which means that the extra regularity is not propagated by the flow. So the standard methods do not propagate. And I'm going to, the point here of this theorem is that if you have this extra regularity for, for, um, for S and omega bar, then the extra regularity is propagated. Okay. Uh, now that, that that's for first is a, is a nice mathematical result, right? So there was something about the structure of the equations, but that turns out to be important for other reasons I'm going to discuss later. There are, there are other important problems you want to track. You want to tackle where these extra regularities need. Okay. And uh, okay, so here's the idea of the proof. So, okay, I, I, I erase the equations, but remember that some of those equations that I wrote, I call them uh, transport D probe because you have some transport equations, but you have some divergence in probes, right? So, the idea is that you want to use your D probe part to gain regularity. My D probe is a, is an elliptic system. Right, so you can use the elliptic regularities to gain the actual derivative. But there's a problem, okay? This is not an honest difficult system because divergence in the curve there is space time. So there is space time. Standard difficult or in an elliptic system along if you have difficult for each constant time slots. Okay, so this is not a, a, a true test. Yes. Yeah, so this is the data, this is the data, this is the data, right? Yeah. Uh, what is the, what is the, uh, is this opposite? Like, what is the regularity? Yeah, so the same is that this is not well opposed with data this. What well, opposed is that if you give me this data, the condition will have the same regularity. It's the same regularity. Oh. And it depends continuous, it depends continuous on the same regularity. We prove that also, that continuous depends on the data, right? Yeah, that's what I said. So the, 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 the regularity is propagated. And the point, and I didn't make myself clear, is that standard methods. You can assume this guy to be h plus a million. It's going to send a message where you can just give h n. Does that answer your question? Okay, so, uh, so, so, so what we have to do here, we have to transform this space time div curve into a true honest spatial div curve. And what we do, we use the condition that u alpha, u alpha. Uh, now you see, you see what is happening here. Okay, so suppose you want to use the transport equation for the vortices. Okay, so this uh, the equation for 
the transport of the vortices tells you this goes like the derivative of u, right? So this will give you an estimate of the form uh, where the, you control the age and form by data for the time integral uh, of the new derivative of one derivative of u in AGI by just standard transport estimates. But now, if you look at the equation uh, satisfied by u, that goes like steam. With some special combination, but again, the vortice of the vorticity, right? Just like the omega. So, if you write standard now energy estimate for this guy, you want to tell that u in n is going to be controlled again by data plus uh, h minus one of the vorticity, right? But h minus one of the vorticity. Right is like uh, h minus one of du, so this is going to be like beta uh, plus uh, h, right? So omega uh, is like du. So in the end, we're going to get something that involves like u in n plus one. Okay, so. So, so here you have, uh, you use this asset here and use it, you know, this like u, so you're going to get that n plus one. So, this is telling if you try, that try to do only energy estimates, you're going to lose the difference. So, only energy estimates are not going to work. So, you have to do this, uh, you have to do these difficult estimates, but as I saw saying, they're going to be space time. So, so, in the end, what saves you. Is the fact that if you look at the uh, vorticity by construction is orthogonal to u. By construction, this is a u orthogonal vorticity. So by construction, is orthogonal to u. So this allows you to write certain derivatives of the vorticity in terms of certain derivatives of u. Okay. And now, this guy here you can decompose in space and time part. Okay, so you can decompose in space and time. And this allows you to solve algebraically for the time derivative of the vorticity. Okay, so you get an expression for the time derivative of the vorticity algebraically, which you can go back and plug back into your space time give go and move the time derivative to the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, you are left only with the true spatial part of the deep curve. And for that guy, you can give it, you can give it cast. Okay. So uh, what is crucial here is sort of this orthogonality condition, which allows you to remove the time part of, of, the, of the argument. Uh, so the part, the part, time part, part of the vorticity, or the derivative of the vorticity from your argument, you can get just this curve. Okay, so that's sort of an idea of how this proof is done, and that's sort of the first application that I have for this um, for this uh, new formulation of equations. Okay. So the construction of omega bar, where does it come from again? The orthogonality. Uh, well, it's it's it's, it's um. You probably wrote it down, though. I yeah, so, sure. So, remember, so this operator here for any vector field uh, is F, so this epsilon alpha beta gamma delta, u beta, d gamma d delta. So by construction, this is orthogonal to you. Because I contract with u alpha, uh, I have u alpha beta here, but this is not a symmetric number. Right? Okay, okay. And then omega is just going to apply this to kg, right? Maybe a minus sign on that. Sure. Okay. Um, now, this is a nice application. But uh, the really ni the nicer one that I want to discuss now uh, is low regularity of solutions. Uh, 
And the basic idea is the following. Um, so, if look at the invocation of this, then your equations take the form of what I mentioned before. You can write them as. Uh, Psi, psi, where psi here are your unknowns, right? Where so you either uh, uh, H or U, which in the rotational case, uh, you can write as a derivative of Okay. So so in the rotational case, there, there is no transport because the transport is for the rotation, there's no rotation. Uh, I didn't show you, but uh, this is the same thing as in classical physics. It's rotation. We can really write your velocity as the derivative of rotation. And then your system will create the form of some nonlinear equations. Now, for this system, the regularity is very always good. Okay. Uh, for equation of this case, you have uh, local well posedness in. A is two plus epsilon or epsilon positive and new poseness in A two. Okay, so there is a threshold of regularity. So if your data is in A two plus epsilon or any epsilon positive, you can solve and get this is a equation that local poseness where you reach constant slice here in regularity. But as well, but if you try to improve this, you go to H2, then, uh, then there's U. Uh, now, th th this result here, uh, well, it's a long story. So, uh, this is the breakthrough result of Smith and Papano in 2005. But before that, there had been many important contributions that kept lowering the regularity of this other theory. Uh, here we have a Bahuri Shaman. Uh, some other work of the time. Uh, Kleiman Wojniewski. And all these works eventually culminated in this uh, uh, optimal regulated result that Smith uh, and had. Uh, for, the, for this kind of nonlinear equations. And the U poseness, this that's what we need to buy. Uh, it's actually earlier than all these results here. I think it's nine and something. Okay. Uh, now, all these words are important because the techniques that are used, that used to, to culminate, they, 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 they were developed through this, during the, over the years for all these works. Okay, so everybody made an important contribution to the field here, the techniques and ideas that eventually. This okay, so now uh, uh, you, you can probably see where I'm going with this, right? So I'm claiming that our system, the basic idea of this new formulation is to see our system's a perturbation of this kind of equations, right? And then I want to know. So for the other equations, we can get local opposing HN or N greater than we have. Plus one, right? So this is like two plus five, uh, which is very far away from two plus epsilon, right? So can we get local opposeness in H two plus epsilon for the relativistic order equations? That's the question of low regularity. Okay. Uh, now again, uh, even though the philosophy is to Think of our equations of perturbation of these nonlinear equations. Uh, you should really think that the rotational phase is qualitatively different. Okay. Uh, it is qualitatively different because, so what I mean by qualitatively different, right? You're not going to be able to improve the regularity for Euler. By simply doing these techniques for weight equations, you need something else. And that should be obvious because in this case, the only characteristics 
are the sound categories, but there's no transport. In the full system, now we have, we have transport. So the full system is a, is a system with multiple characteristics, right? So this one we call like multiple characteristics. Okay. So, uh, so the whole point then is uh, how to do that. Okay, and that's what I want to discuss for the last episode. Well. I talk about this more than that. So, is, is the problem clear? What I want to do? Okay. Now, before I discuss relativistic polar equations, I'm going to go back. Discuss this result for the classical compressor. Uh, the main reason being is that the equations are simpler, much simpler in this case. Okay, so let me discuss this for the classical order case, and then I tell you how you can generalize those ideas for the relative case. Okay. Now I'm not going to go back and rewrite all the notions for the for the, uh, the, the compressor class order. So let me just make the following remarks: a similar, as I said before, similar new formulation uh, holds for classical order. In particular, for the class quarter, you also have an acoustical metric, as you should have, because you have propagation of sound, most classical fluids. Uh, and I'm going to use the same notation that I've been using so far, but my notation is going to be something slightly different than classical phase. So this guy here now, that I'll be in the log uh, uh, enthalpy, this guy is going to be the log of the density okay, in the class. Uh, U is going to be the classical velocity. It means that U now is a vector field on three components. I'm going to denote by B the material derivative. This is the analog of the U derivative that we had for the uh, And you still have omega. S, which are like the vorticity uh, in the entropy gradient, uh, more precisely, this guy is, uh, this guy is the vorticity divided by the density. Okay? This guy is the probability divided by all these specific things. But the details are not important. What? They're important because I'm going uh, to write the equation in a schematic form. I just want to keep track of, um, of what the values mean. And then in the classical case, similar to what I showed before, you can define the analog of these variables C and D. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so with this motion here, I can now state the theorem, and then I, I hope to give you some details of the proof. Here is a theorem. So this is a So we consider the step. Huh? The last one, the step. Yeah. Uh, consider. Uh, Data of classical order that find the following uh, properties. Okay. Uh, U and O of U are in age two plus absent. And S is in H3 plus X. So 
So here, uh, sigma zero is just by the initial surface. This variable is C and D. Uh, it belongs some other space. Often going to be some small number. Uh, and three along sigma zero. Uh, the data is contained uh, in this figure of a compact that K of state space and the density Bound from below, and the sound speed bounded uh, above and below. I'll come in the assumption of that, okay. Then the conclusion uh, is that uh, the solution classical uh, of existence depends only on uh, D. In the regularity property. I'm going to explain what's, what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we're going to take data for class provider. And we want to look at smooth data. But this, the fact that smooth data is not important because all our quantitative estimates depend only on the norms that we state. Okay, so this is just a usual thing. Right? You write energy estimates, you start with smooth solution, then you write your estimates. But in the end, actually, your estimates depend only on the, the norms that you're trying to control. right? But so the point that you have a, a smooth data, so you have a classical group of forces, so you have your classical final resistance. But I'm going to assume a bound for the following norms of the data. I'm going to assume that you know that the uh, uh, log density and the velocity are in ages two plus epsilon. That's the regularity I want, uh, low regularity, right? Your epsilon is a small number. Okay, so Now, in addition to this, so, so this, is the, this is the thing that I really want. This would be like the optimal regularity, right? But you need, a, you need some a little more regularity because you need to see the curl of u is also in h to plus f. Okay, so generally u is in h to plus f, and the curl is going to be in h1. We assume a little more regularity for the curl. Now, we assume a little more for the entropy as well, but this, should, this is okay because I just showed for the entropy, typically you can gain a derivative. Right, so this is the so this assumption is the low regularity analog of what the improved regularity that I showed you before. Okay, then we have this variable C and D. Remember, this guy is like the vorticity of the vorticity, and it's like, it's like this guy is like a derivative of the entropy right? These variables we have to assume that they belong in some holder space. For some alpha as well. And we're explain why that's good. Okay, but we also need to guys. And the third assumption is the standard, it's just some non-degeneracy assumption. Okay. 
So you're assuming that you know that uh, you are uh, you don't have a vacuum boundary, so your density law is bound from below, and your sound speed uh, is bounded from below and above. And you know, so again, this this is a hyperbolic problem. So you can imagine if you want that everything is constant outside a set. So then when the, the, the data is not constant, everything is going to be contained in a compact set in the state space. If you look at the values of the data taken in the state space, you know, these are the compact set. So this, so this, this is just a non-degenerate assumption. And then the conclusion is that the classical time of existence depends only on these norms, depends only on this on the on a bound on a bound for the image two plus epsilon and the C0 of the box. And moreover, this is the regularity is propagated, which means that you give me uh, data in these, these norms, the norms, so what, what I mean by the regularity is propagated, right? I mean that the norms that you control are uniformly bounded by functions of D and K. Now, D and K are the two things that set up the data, right? And again, forget about K. K is just a number that the whole thing is like you have an initial data which has a bound D, right? And then the norms at a later time are controlled uniformly by the norm at time is zero. Okay, that's the point. So, so you, in other words, you get an energy estimate. That's what I'm saying. You get a, you get, you can close an energy estimate in this low regularity models. Okay, so the function line, maybe should write this down. We can close an estimate in the state of norms. Okay. Which means if you look at these norms at time t, they're controlled by the corresponding norm time z. Uh, no, they're not the same. Uh, they're, they're different two aspects. First, uh, okay, so, so our theorem can be came first. Okay? Then later on, she proved that actually she, what she was. Very much she, she did, she removes the yeah. Okay, yeah. right? So, uh, so she improved on this theorem, right? So, this, so that's her result. Uh, but our, our theorem came first. And when, we, when we were doing this, we didn't know how to remove the assumption. So we, we, this and later on she came along and, and removed the assumption. Okay. In fact, I should point out that as far as, as we know, this is so remember, this is a system with multiple characteristics. Too. So this is the first low regularity result of argument for a system with multiple characteristics. Okay. But she was able to improve by removing the assumption. But then the, but there's an, another aspect in which this is different that it's quite remarkable that you can propagate this whole remark. So in that sense, no, even though she removed, we still think that, yeah, the, the statement is stronger, uh, the assumption we have, but there is this aspect that you can, you can propagate this whole, whole the regularity. Now, remember, it's a hyperbolic problem. You should not expect it to be propagated the whole the norms, the whole the regularity of solution, right? But you, you can do that. Okay. Does that answer your question? Just also, just to understand the um, rewriting. Mm -hmm. um, The rewriting for the relativistic Euler mm -hmm. and the rewriting for the classical Euler. Mm -hmm. Wh which one was which one was before the, the classical came first? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so in this paper, the rewriting was already a tool that could be used. Yes. So the rewriting yes. had to be done. No, no, no. We, 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 we pulled directly from uh, okay. Jared and John. Okay, okay. No, that would be too much. <laughs> Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, um, oh, you know, since, since, uh, since you asked, right after Chan's results came out, there was a there was an alternative proof of her result by Anderson and Tang. The next proof? Uh, yeah, it's shorter because I think they they, they rely a lot more on this with the So Chan's proof more or self-contained. And the uh, Anderson saying they rely a lot on this with Okay. Uh, so let's discuss um, uh, 
So let me try to, to give an idea of the proof, okay? So let me start with energy aspects. Now, uh, again, I want to get the schematic, so I'm going to, for simplicity, so I'm going to assume that the entropy is constant. To assume this, um, the equation is simplified considerably. Okay. In this case, D is zero, and that complicated C becomes simply D to the minus H curl of omega. Okay. Um, yeah. In this case, it doesn't matter how I write it. And this is a coefficient, so from now on, I'm going to essentially think that C is the curl of omega. Okay. Again, the whole point of constructing C is that you cannot control this guy directly, right? So you need all the extra stuff. But just from the point of view of the derivative count, I'm going to think that C is the color of that. Okay. And then uh, the equations, the equations, so I'm going to write symbolically psi, psi is going to be H in U. Uh, and these are going to be like the wave variables. We want to satisfy wave equations. Uh, and omega in C, that's what we call omega. These are going to be the transport values. So this satisfies transport. Okay. And then in this notation, this is the notation, the, the, the new formulation of the equations can be written schematically as follows. I'm like very schematic equations just with the terms that we use derivative count from the address. Right? So the wave operator for either A to U, like C plus some quadratic term psi. The transport of omega is only the psi. The transport of the curl of omega is the of psi times omega. And they have the divergence of omega is only the psi. Okay. And I didn't highlight this when I stated the equation before, but let me just point out that this equation here. Is not simply the curl of this equation. Because take the curl of this equation, you get two views of. Okay. So here's another example, like we have constellations going on. Okay, so constellations. Okay. okay, so and now we're going to do energy aspects. Okay, so remember, we're going to control the balls control. Like the two plus epsilon of that, right? It's something the vortices. Let's just look at this guy. Okay. Uh, so what you do? Let's take one plus epsilon derivatives of the whole function, right? So this is going to involve one plus epsilon derivatives of Right, and this term here is good. This, this term here is, is good by the volume of two point zero three. Right. Okay. Uh, so, so again, we're, we're going to do an energy aspect. So this is going to give control of the one plus s derivative of one derivative of psi. So it's going to be like two plus s derivatives. So you need to control this guy here in the other two right? This guy. Okay. So how we control this guy? Well, we have an evolution equation for the code, right? So now we take one plus s and derivative of the equation for the code, so it'll be one plus s, of omega, right? And two plus s and derivative of, uh, of uh, psi is fine. So in the end, we're going to get something that involves uh, two plus s and derivatives of the omega, right? So two plus s derivatives of psi is fine. Uh, now, for you to close, you need this guy to be now two, right? For this, this guy is now two, we got to 
to control the one, it's like one possessed to control this guy, you know, right? But this is just transport to the main derivatives, right? Now, how can you try to control this guy now? So, well, remember, you can do something like uh, div curl, right? So, you can control, in principle, one derivative of this guy in L2 in terms of the divergence of this guy in L2 plus the curl of this guy in L2, which means if you want, if you want uh, to plus that, you only have to take right one more derivative, right? So, you can take one plus epsilon everywhere. And now this guy, when you are gonna plug it back here, so it's a guy that you're gonna be able to, to, to run all, but then you have to control d1 plus f so the divergence of the next. But d d1 plus f from the divergence of omega, you get from this equation here, which is two plus f of psi, which is good. Okay, two plus epsilon psi is good. So everything seems to close with one caveat. When you grow more everything, you get the data. So you're going to get two plus f on derivative of this guy times zero. And that's why you have an assumption that the vertice is also two plus f. Remember that we assume that we assume uh, h u two plus f, but you also assume that the vertice would be more than two plus f. And that's because of this term. Because when you grow more, you're going to get the data. So you can close if the data is fine, right? If it's not fine, then it's not good, right? So that explains this assumption. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> so you do this. So in the end, you get a standard energy estimate. Now that assumption the data, which says that you can control one derivative of psi on that one plus one derivative of omega. You know, plus epsilon. I'm not going to write the data, but in the end, what you get? You get a standard uh, all term, which is like a, a time integral of the non the infinity. Right? The infinity is coming because you dwell to an infinity, right? You have a square term, you put the two in your term, and you put the other. Okay, so that's right. <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, this is the two plus epsilon. Oh no, yeah, it's all for that because I have it. Okay, so this is a two plus epsilon control, right? This is like a two plus epsilon control. So everything boils down to control the zero right? Now, here's the part where low regularity comes in. So if you, if, if you are not doing low regularity, how to control this guy in your standard theory? It was to do sublet embedding, right? Sublet embedding, but for sublet embedding to work, you need uh, S to be greater than, you know, uh, right? And then you can control these guys through these norms, and then the time integral actually, you know, so for this guy on the right hand side. So the whole point now is how to control these anything norms. And that's where these ideas from the equations come in, because the whole point of the whole that I was mentioning before of the low regularity from weight equations is about controlling these infinite ones, right? So we need to control, we need to control the following uh, space time norms, right? Okay. We need to control the space time norms of these guys in terms of the data, right? So if I can do that, then this is control in terms of the data, I close the answer, right? That's what I want. Now, for this guy, well, as I said, there's this entire framework for development based on strict assessments. 
typical estimates. So, so you, have, you have to see these the typical estimates are the spending of estimates that are developed for wave equations. They are precisely the estimates for mixed space time models. You, you're doing a modern time at the space, but there is a entire family where there's a certain combination of the exponents, a certain exponent time and exponent in space, which you, you can control for wave equations. So that is super estimates. And here we only need the simple ones at one time and in space. Okay. Now, simple estimates, I'm gonna I'll probably tomorrow, not my to focus today. They're based on dispersion. Okay. In the end, everything boils down to get some dispersive estimates for your solution. And now you can see this is the problem. There is no strict estimates for this guy, because this guy try to transport the equation. And transport equations don't disperse. There are no dispersive assets for transport equations, right? These are just propagates along the characteristics, the whole lines. Okay. So this guy knows. So that's where uh, that's that's that, that's where things start become complicated. But then you say, okay, hold on. But remember, for for, for the, the, the transport variables, they satisfy transport equation. But it satisfies more, it satisfies a div ecosystem. So if you want to, so it's okay, not no street cards, but you can do a little test. But you can't because Calderon Zim operators are not bound in any field, right? There are no elliptic estimates in any field. And here's where we cheat. The LZ norm is controlled. By some small holder norm. And for holder norms, you do have elliptic estimates. But then, if we're going to again do this, you have to put this on the data, right? So that's what explains our assumption, right? That, that's the whole point. So if you could do, if you could do counter on zero and infinity, this will not be needed, okay? So that's the reason why you need to do that. Okay. And then you can already see why Chian had to work really hard to remove the assumption because it's not non trivial stuff. This is a really sticky point. Very really sticky point. Okay. Okay, so how is that done? Uh, in the end, like, um, like uh, like everything, well, first of all, let me make up the observation. Just using Cauchy Schwartz in time, you can replace this uh, L1 by L2. Okay, and of course, L2 is more convenient, right? Because it's a, it's a human space, right? Okay, so the way we do this is the following uh, we have the following bootstrap assumptions. Okay. We say that this guy. Uh, in, uh, in uh, L2 in time, and infinity space, plus the sum of mu greater or equal to 2 of mu to 2 delta naught this by uh, L2 infinity plus 1. And exactly the same thing for Omega. Okay. Where here, mu is a dyadic number, so like for powers of two. P is the little wood power projection onto dyadic frequencies. And delta naught is some small number that depends on X. The exact depends on the point. So we do the usual thing. We have a bootstrap assumption, and the whole argument means that we have to improve the bootstrap assumption. In the end, you want to improve this to show that it's less or equal than t, a small t is the t of the bootstrap, so a small power. Okay, small power. This will be so. So if you do that, then you close the bootstrap, then everything is going to be controlled. Now, let me point out that if you look at what I just told you, say, okay, you only need to control this, right? So that's why you put their good step assumption. So if you control this guy, right, in terms of the data, then you control the L1, right? And if you control the L1, you control the interior of the 
But turns out, for technical reasons, you also need this. Basically, if, we, if all we were to do were energy estimates, this was not needed. But in the end, you have to do more than energy estimates. You have to also control the geometry of the acoustic network. You have to control the acoustic geometry. The leaking phase injection operator is that uh, with respect to the diffusion energy or is that with respect to that? Yeah, you need a very clean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's a good question if you gain anything, try to do with respect to something else. It's a good question. Maybe, 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 maybe there might be something. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's worth thinking about. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so, so in the end, you need this guy to uh, control the acoustic jump. So, so what I will do now, uh, let me try to give you the roadmap for the bootstrap. Okay, let me try to give the roadmap for the bootstrap. So, here's how the armor works. So we start with the bootstrap assumptions. And from there, we have energy estimates. Um, and you have other estimates. For transport Okay, so assuming the bootstrap, we can derive energy estimates and can write all the double estimates. Then here you get um, control of the acoustic joint. And once you control the acoustic geometry, so I'm going to explain all this. I'm just write some words here. So we get boundaries of the performing energy, or A performing energy. And that gives you uh, an A for linear waves. The background. Give you a linear sequence. And this guy gives you improvement. Uh, this guy, this guy, give you improvement on transport stack. This guy. Put guy together, give you three cuts or problem. So I'm trying to explain that. The reason why it is this because the bootstrap argument is very, it's very dense. Okay, so I'm trying to kind of break down. So, and I want to highlight which part of this argument. Are sort of you know, new and which parts are more or less you no know, relying on the things that are the things that have been done for way before. So we start with our bootstrap. From that you can do like energy estimates, which is you know, I was just showing you before, right? And of course, once you assume the bootstrap, then you close it, right? Because the, the, the time integral of that job is bound by the bootstrap. But you have to do as I said, you have to do uh, you have to do uh, uh, Hold their estimates both for transport and elliptic. Okay, uh, so this is 
so, so this part is new, okay? So this is new uh, because they are saying, so typically if you're doing transport estimates, you have to do transport estimates uh, in, you know, like in L2 basis space. You don't do transport estimates in both. But here's what we have to do then. So you have to compute the whole norms. And you have this transport value satisfy transport. So there are some interesting aspects of this, some interesting technicalities, which are somewhat hidden that I'm going to discuss tomorrow. Okay? Now, once you have this by the bootstrap, then you have to control the acoustic drive. This is, of course, uh, already for the wave equation, view wave equation, the main difficulty, right? Turns out, and I'm going to explain this tomorrow. That you cannot fully control everything. You cannot, you cannot really close the bootstrap without deriving some complementary estimates for several geometric quantities of the acoustical metric. So if you look at the acoustical metric as a geometry, then you can look at things like you know the sound cones, and then you look at its uh, you know uh, no second fundamental form. Look at uh, no no expansions and all those things, all those kind of things, right? Uh, those things need to be controlled. So you can only close the argument if you control if you have complementary estimates at the same regularity level and at regularity level consistent with the estimates for all these geometric points. And this this is really coming from jar, right? That's why you're using the ideas from general relativity. But we have a crucial new element here. The transport guys appear as sources. When you look at the, when you look at the equations for all the geometric quantities, now you have a source term which is coming from the transport, which is not present in the pure wave case. And if you look at the regularity of the source terms, it looks like it doesn't close. So some, some something more or less miraculous has to happen. Okay. So this is really a reflection. This these source terms, if you if sure to point out where you have just let me say this, you have just two, two propagation phenomena, sound waves and transport. But of course, sound waves and transport, they, prop, they, they interact with each other. And if you were to pinpoint where, where the interactions happen in the point from, from a mathematical point of view, is here, okay, because they appear as source terms. Now, once you do that, then you can obtain boundaries of a conformal energy. What, what, what does that mean? Look, in the end, uh, in the end, you're going to reduce your problem to some weighted estimates, estimates with weights. Okay. And the way to get, well, there are different ways, but the way that it has been done most successfully to get uh, estimates with weights for your, for your variables or for your weight variables by introducing something called a conformal energy. I'm going to explain tomorrow. But why is this? Why does it fall conformal? Because for technical reasons, you cannot work with the acoustical metric. You have to make a conformal change. I'm going to explain this in the next lecture. Okay? So you have to make a conformal change. So you cannot work with the acoustical metric itself. There's a conformal change. That's why this is called the conformal. But once you have that, then you can show that your linear waves. So if you look at the linear wave equation, but with respect to the acoustical metric, those you get decay. Okay. And now, why why you have linear waves? Because well, it's a complicated argument, but in the end, you use a Duhamel argument. Duhamel allows you to reduce things to box phi equals zero, right? So use a Duhamel argument, and the Duhamel lets you to reduce things to a linear wave equation. But you have to be careful because this is a linear wave equation on G background. So it's not like you know you became plain old linear wave equation. So the coefficients of the wave, wave operator is still depend on the acoustical metric, which are rough. Okay. But if you do that, then there's an abstract argument called the uh, TT star argument, which says that given the K estimates for linear waves, you can obtain linear strict adjustment. Okay, that's an abstract argument. Uh, involves some water. And roughly, if you haven't seen this, we'll explain. So what, what does decay have to do with duality? The basic idea is that you want to do a duality with respect to this space-time norms. So the space-time norms involve a time index. So for the duality to work, 
things need to have the correct time integrability. So we need to have the correct time integrability for the dual to work. Then correct time integrability means that things have to allow, have some decaying time in this case. Okay, so things are integrable time. Once you do that, you can improve your estimates with your good set of assumptions for the wave part. And then you combine your improvement for the wave part with your older estimates for the transport part, then you can improve the bootstrap assumptions for them. Both variables can get those, those two things combined to give you the full quasi linear strip estimate. Now. Okay. Now, all this part here, this part of the argument is the part that's relying heavily on GR and wave equations. So here's where we borrow a lot of things from the previous words I mentioned before, going back to Bahu Shaman and past Kleiman, Rodensky, Smith, and Batar, and so on. But we cannot use as a black box. Okay. So this part, because here you have the transport. You cannot use it as a black box because there are several reductions that are carried out. And we have to be very careful that the reductions still go through with these extra terms coming from the transport part. It would be great. If you could use as a black box, just quote those old papers, that would be great, but we can't. Okay, we have to go through the reductions. Okay. So this is sort of the logic, and you can see it's kind of sort of complicated, but uh, what I want to do. Uh, I want to see if I can discuss at least this aspect of the argument in some detail. Okay, so we can, uh, so we can get an idea of uh, how, how, how the things I, I have. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to discuss this tomorrow, but almost, but I have five minutes left, so let me just give a sort of a high level discussion on this, and then tomorrow I can give more details, okay? So where do we see the propagation of the holder by cloud? Here. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe, can, yeah, maybe I can discuss this one first, because this one I can explain. Maybe five minutes. Okay, so uh, yeah, so let me discuss this one. I'm gonna start from time. So this propagation of the whole irregularity. Okay, so so here's the idea. Okay, so you want to estimate some whole the normal time. Okay. Which means that in the end, you need to look at quantities of the form right? So you're going to have two, you have two points here, x minus y, and you need to estimate this sort of an old uh, uh, thing. Okay. For course, I mean, uh, the only information that you have are the bootstrap assumptions and information about the data. So somehow you need to connect this with it. So what you can do is the following. Uh, because because uh, your quantities are going to satisfy transport equations, you can look at your solution here and see how it's being transported from some x at time zero. And you can look at our solution here and see how it's being transported from some y times z. So these are the flow lines of b, right? So remember, this is the vector field z plus y z i is transported. But it's not only this, you also have to compare x minus y, which in principle, if you just think of these two points. It could be anything without relation to this response to, to the initial points here. So you also have to see how these points are connected to the original values by solving the transport equation, which gives you how point x at time zero goes to point x at time t via the flow lines of b. Right? You just solve like the OD that gives you the x at time t is going to be. Uh, Something transport along the line of V connected to X and Z. 
But I was one estimate, right? That tells you the regularity of the flow lines matter. So the only so in the end, you want to show that if you look at x minus y times t, somehow that's comparable to x minus y times zero, right? Because this guy here, you can connect with f. Of equations, so you need to connect this guy as well to it comparable because you can if you can compare everything with the guy times zero, then now this is just our whole denominator times zero, right? So you need to transport the transport variable, but you also need to transport the points that you evaluate your whole experiment. But for this to be true, you need to have good quantitative control of the flow lines of it. And most problems have to be a triviality. But here, because of our local regularity assumptions, this has to be very, very carefully and has to be done, let's say, in the correct order to close the bootstrap. One thing that I didn't mention, but I think this picture more has captured is that there is, a, there is a precise order that you need to do to close the bootstrap. But the bootstrap is just so complicated that you have to do things the right order. Okay. So in particular, that, that appears here. Okay. So at some point, you have to have control of the regularity of the flow lines of D, and that's what allows you to do estimates in holding spaces for transport equations. Okay, that's kind of the, the idea. Okay, I'm going to stop here. So tomorrow we come back and talk about uh, control of the acoustic geometry, and I hope to be, talk, be talking also about street All right, let's thank you so all right, any questions? Any questions on Zoom? All right, if not, well, let's uh, let's thank Marcelo again. Thank <laughs> you.